Well, Joanne Froggett, uh, you play Anna on Downton Abbey, and this season, season four, she was at the center of probably the most explosive storyline we've ever seen on that show. Uh, she was sexually assaulted by uh, another servant. During a wonderful moment, there is uh, Dame Kiri T. Kanawa giving a concert upstairs, and downstairs, Anna's uh, raped by uh, the valet, Green. How did that storyline come onto your radar? How soon in advance did you know about it? How did you prepare for those scenes? Um, I didn't know very far in advance. I um, went to, I actually went to speak to Gareth Neem, our exec producer, and I was um, just looking for information about what I was going to be doing this year for season four. Um, and said, you know, what, what's in store for Anna and Bates this season? I just, you know, I'd like to know what, you know, what they're kind of, where they're going this season. And Gareth um, just said to me, he just said, oh, you know, it's, it's big this year. It's really big. He put a really big storyline. And I said, okay, what, what is it? <laughs> he was like, because they, because we all just get to read the storylines when we get the scripts. Um, however, I think he felt like maybe I should have a, a little bit of a heads up that there was you know, something I needed to prepare for, but he didn't want to tell me exactly what, out of courtesy to the other cast, because nobody gets to know beforehand what their stories are. So he said, you know, I'd really prefer for you to read it, but um, but yeah, we, you know, there's something you are really going to have to, um, you know, concentrate on this year. Um, so I was, so I, I had no idea what it was. Um, read the script, and you know, I was. Totally surprised, like, you know. I, I wasn't expecting that at all, as you know, as neither were the audience or, or anybody else. Which, um, as an actress, I was, you know, really pleased to be given that opportunity and to be given that responsibility to do such a, um, you know, such a sensitive storyline in, in a show like Downton. And so my first reaction was was really just just straight away starting to think about how to tackle you know this subject matter um, when whenever I've done you know um, sensitive uh, subject matters or tackled sensitive subject matters in drama previously to Downton the, the main thought that's on my mind is of people that may have gone through similar experiences that, that may be watching the show and, and viewers that may connect with, with the character or the situation that you're playing um, so that's always at the forefront of my mind, really, and that's my responsibility to do a good job for those people in, in my head. That's how I see it, that I'd, you know, I'd never forgive myself if somebody was watching it and, and felt I hadn't given it 100% or, you know, or that it wasn't believable in some way. Um, so that's, you know, that's all it really comes down to to me, to just do the research and do everything that I need to do to make to make this situation for this character as believable as possible for the audience. Right, and what's interesting, I think you played a soldier with PTSD, I think, right before Down, didn't you? And and that's yeah. a contemporary issue. You can sort of, you know, and it's shell shock back in World War One, but now PTSD, and people talk about it. At the time, in 1922, Anna, uh, you know, was so vulnerable in that household and, and wouldn't talk about a, a sexual assault. Even nowadays, it's very difficult for women to come forward. So, uh, you know, how did you sort of tap into that to be so contained within it? Uh, you know, when 2014 Joanne Fraga would have, you know, gone to the police and sh shouted it from the rooftops and said, "Get that man." Uh, yeah, that was, you know, one of the big questions for me actually, because in, you know, with our modern brains, um, we desperately want Anna to tell somebody and, and you know, this man to, um, to, to get his, you know, to get his, um, you know, just desserts, if you like. So it's, it was, that's one thing I found difficult because I was, I, I kept, you know, I did lots of research on sexual attacks and, um, and women's, read a lot of women's stories that have been through similar experiences, but that obviously they were modern day. Um, and even now, you know, women still find it incredibly difficult to come forward or, um, you know, to speak out about what's happened to them because um, they're very, you know, very confused about what's happened, depending, you know, every situation is different. But, um, you know, some these situations can be, well, you know, incredibly confusing as well as incredibly traumatic. So, um, 
But I spoke to Alistair Bruce, who's our historical advisor at um, Downton, and um, he was really helpful in kind of putting me in the mindset of um, a working class woman in the nineteen in the early nineteen twenties. And he reminded me that you know all a woman of Anna's social standing had was her reputation. And right. unfortunately, back at that time, um, society would have still seen it as a as a mar on her character. And society would have seen it as, oh, well, he's only a man, he can help himself. Um, which, thank God, we've moved on so much more in the, in the Western world, you know, nowadays and in our views on, on this, this sort of subject matter. But, um, but back then, and, and, you know, that's, that's how people still thought. So if, it, if um, it became public knowledge what happened to Anna, she could lose her family, you know, her husband, Mr. Bates. She could use, lose her job because it possibly would have brought, you know, disrepute onto the house. Um, and she'd have lost her reputation. And without reputation and, and a good reference, she could have literally been destitute. You know, she could have lost everything she had. And, um, you know, there was no um, social security system or any of those right. things back then. You know, so if you lost your job, you, you lost everything. You know, you, you had no way to... Uh, to feed yourself, to house yourself, to so it, it was just getting the enormity of, of that in, into my head, and also based on the characters of Anna and Mr. Bates, Anna also has this this added fear that um, that you know after something happens to Mr. Green, <laughs> no. if people find out that what happened to her, they're going to presume that Mr. Bates has has uh, you know wreaked his revenge on Mr. Green, um, and obviously because he's been in uh, prison before, you know, Anna's terrified that, that he'll be hung for something he, you know, for a crime he hasn't committed, or just that, you know, just that she'll lose him altogether. So, or or has he committed it? I mean, that's that's always sort of at the end of well, the her head. She definitely hasn't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but she's a little confused. She's just, you know, I think she's trying to. Con well, in my head, she's she's trying to convince herself. You no, know, she can't possibly believe Mr. Bates would do that. But there's this little doubt in her mind that she's just wondering, has he? And if he did, and you know, what does what would that mean? And you know, all the consequences of, of, of this event are just constantly, you know, um, right. you know, going round and round in, in Anne's head, really. And then you've got these unlikely allies, in a way, of Mrs. Hughes and Lady Mary. You know, sort of almost conspiring together to keep Anna from learning. That there there is a strong possibility Bates has done it. it it's the the what's so interesting about your character, I think, is that and the, why she's so beloved is the the, the warmth of her and the, the, that courtship of Bates. It's done with such it's quiet, but throughout you know versus the the Mary uh, Matthew love upstairs. There's that growing love with. Uh, Bates and Anna downstairs. Uh, you, you know, you and Brendan Coyle have this wonderful chemistry. Did you have to audition together? Were you set cast separately, and it was just wonderful happenstance that you did? It, it sort of was actually. Yeah, I mean, I know Julian wrote the parts of Mr. Bates with with Brendan Coyle in mind to play, um, and then I just went along for one audition for Anna. Um, but it took about two. It took about two weeks to find out, which is which is actually quite a long time in the UK. Um, and I think it was because um, they'd, or they'd already had Brendan in mind from the start. They wanted me, but they were slightly worried because there's an age gap. And originally the characters, yes. the characters were, the, their love story happened much quicker in the original script. So they decided to kind of stick with Brendan and I, but um, slow down the, the journey of them falling in love and, and make it, you know, about this sort of mutual respect and admiration and friendship that, that grows into this, you know, into, into this great love, if you like. And, and actually, I think it made it so much more romantic because they're, they're the aspects of relationship that you really believe will keep this couple together for a lifetime, you know, that real faith in each other, that, that strong bond, trust between them. Um, they are best friends, you know, and that's, that's the reality, I think, of... of you know, a long-lasting relationship. Well, there's some, yeah, and there's some wonderful moments in season four. I mean, uh, pr before the, uh, uh, the sexual assault clouds everything. I mean, when you're with Rose at the dance. I mean, Anna seems to be sort of uh, drawn into these upstairs schemes. You know, whether it's Lady Rose sort of trying to see how the other 91, 99 percent live. Uh, 
did, did you, when you auditioned, I mean, uh, do you ever look at the upstairs with a little envy? I mean, you know, Anna has one nice outfit. You know, Lady Mary has 101 nice outfits. Is that we something... A nice outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, okay. Something, it's uh, it's yeah, dowdy... Yeah, well, we always joked early on, all the downstairs girls, that, you know, we're, we're really, we've got costume envy of, you know, of the girls upstairs. And, and I, I'm, you know, I love fashion, I love clothes, so, um, so I'm always kind of saying, oh, that, you know, that beading's beautiful and this is gorgeous. And, um, but, um, but I'm not really envious of them because they have to do, you know, on set, they have to do, you know, sometimes four changes a day, whereas I only have two different black dresses most of the time. So practically, I, I get a much easier run of things, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And also, I don't have to worry about spoiling anything. My, my costume's very robust and sturdy, and I can have a, you know, I can have a little 10-minute power nap at lunchtime and uh, not worry about ruining anything. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it, it's, it's better. But no, we don't get to play the glamour, which is, um, which is a shame. Yeah, but then, I mean, you all scrub up very well because, you know, whether you, you're doing a lot of red carpets and award shows, the Screen Actors Guild, you've been nominated for an Emmy two years ago. Uh, you know, who won the Emmy that year was uh, Maggie Smith, Dame Maggie Smith, the Dowager. You know, this is, uh, you don't really get to uh, interact with her, though, do you, on, on, on screen? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Maggie is, um, you know, the dowager is one character that Anna doesn't really have anything to do with because in real life they probably wouldn't, you know. Right. Um, so it's a shame. I think Maggie and I had one small scene together where, uh, in, it, might been, it was two I think, where she told me to remove some flowers but I, di I didn't get to talk back to her. So <laughs> it's a bit of a shame. I didn't have a scene with Maggie but maybe, no, maybe no. one day before we finish I'll have one. You, you know, it's interesting. I mean, she's a northern girl like you. You're actually from Yorkshire, where Downton said, aren't you? I am, yes, originally, yes. Yeah. yeah so, originally. you know, she. So she's from, it's just so interesting, the, the actress Maggie Smith, she's from sort of rather more humble beginnings than the Dowager. Do you, is that something you'd like to be able to play going forward, different kinds of roles, things that aren't necessarily sort of uh, working class? Uh, I know, oh, yeah, you know, um, you know, I always, I'm always striving to do different things, and not because, not just for the sake of doing different things, just because that's kind of the person I am, and I, you know, I thrive on a challenge, and I thrive on, you know, playing different accents, different, um, you know, different characters, different scenarios, different states, social statuses. So um, certainly, you know, as an actor, that's I think that's why most actors get into this business because they want to play you know, lots of different roles and, and lots of variation. Right. Um, then, I'm always excited by things that are, that are very different from the last thing I've played. Um, so I'm always well, kind of is, something new. Yeah. Well, I read, I had to triple check my notes, quite frankly, because I just read about, you're going to be in the West End, uh, the premiere of Rabbit Hole, a play that won Cynthia Nixon, the Tony, and Nicole Kidman, the Oscar. It's an American uh, middle-class woman who has to deal with the uh, tragic death of her son. But I had to triple-check my notes, not because of that, but because of who's directing it. Tell us who's directing yes. this uh, production. Uh, Nigel Harmon is directing, who played Mr. Green on Downton. Um, so, yes, so we're, we'll be back working together, but um, as director, he'll be directing me this time instead of uh, acting partner. And, and Mr. Green, of course, was the man that, that uh, assaulted Anna. I mean, it, yes. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so shocking to me. When did, uh, when did, you, did you two talk about this then, or is this a more recent, uh, did this come onto your radar more recently, Rabbit Hole? Um, no, it's much more recent. No, um, Nigel didn't mention it to me back then at all. I mean, we, when we, were work, we worked really well together. We had a great time working together. Um, and you know he's a great actor, and he's hugely experienced in theatre as well. And he's, you know, Olivier award-winning. And he, um, we were chatting, you know, as you do, and he just said that he he's wanting to move into directing. Um, but that's really as far as the conversation went. And then uh, a few weeks ago, he uh, he contacted my agent, and they sent me the script through for for Rabbit Hole, um, and said, you know. Which, was I interested? And as soon as I read it, I mean, it's the most beautifully written play. It's incredible. David Lindsay Bear is just an amazing writer. So, um, yeah, so I just jumped at the chance, really. I'm, I'm really excited about it.
Um, it's great to be doing the theatre, 130 for three years, so I'm really looking forward to that. And um, it's quite a challenge, you know, it's quite a role to take on. It's going to be a challenge, but like I say, I kind of thrive on that a little bit, so I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, back to that storyline that Nigel was part of, I mean, the, there was, I, when we were talking to Gareth Neen, the producer the other day, we, he talked about the media firestorm about it in England and how it really was sort of self-generated. There were a, a couple of complaints to the regulator the night of, uh, but then sort of the papers whipped it up. I guess you wouldn't have been surprised that the media was looking for a story, but how did you deal with sort of being in the crossfire, having this sort of come out of the blue and then, uh, you know, what was, was that, how challenging was that for you? Um, you know, I, I think you just have to take or, you know, things like that in, with a pinch of salt, really. I think the best thing to do is just not get to, not think about it too much because it's not something that, you know, I can't control. Um, and all I can do is do the best possible job that I can with the work that I've been given. Um, and everything else is sort of out of my hands, really. Um, you know, I've always defended the show for, for doing, for tackling this storyline and for, for Ju and Julian for writing it. Um, and I think it's an I think it's an important subject matter to, to talk about, you know. And, and I think it's a very powerful thing that a drama can at least start discussions about very sensitive subject matters. Um, so I mean, all the feedback I got from viewers was very, very positive. But um, but the, the UK press certainly, you know, it was I guess you know quite a negative response because they were saying why did Downton do this story and it, you know it shouldn't have been on Downton and, and all these things. But but ultimately, you know, I I can I can only do my job and and you know hope that that people react to it in in the way that it was meant. And if they don't, like I say, it's all out of my hands really. What, what is in your hands, though, is you have to pick one episode of the 11 uh, if you're nominated for an Emmy so that the panels can watch. I mean, you, this is a real tough choice for you this year, isn't it? I mean, do you have any idea of where you're leaning, which one you might submit? Um, I'm not sure, really. I haven't really thought that far ahead. Um, I think, you know, obviously episode three is very dramatic when the attack happens, but also I think possibly the more interesting part of the story is episode four or five when Anna and Anna's struggling to come to terms with, what, with what's happening to her and she's, she can't express herself to Mr. Bates and there's, that, that's their whole emotional journey. I feel, you know, I feel that's the, that's the part of, of this situation that, that Julian wanted to focus on, you know, what happens right. after some things. Yeah, after it. Sure. Um, well, we'll, no, I'm, sure, I'm not sure, it's a difficult one. Well, we, you know, we'll, we'll uh, take up your cause for you. We'll, we'll ask our uh, users who are real Emmy watchers as to which one they think. So we'll, we'll let you know what, what the viewer's choice is. Oh, um, certainly. Certainly. Uh, you know, what's fascinating uh, here in America, and in England it's always done well, sort of a 40 share Sunday nights, you know, it's, a, it's a required viewing. But in America, PBS has seen these ratings rise every year. I mean, it's now you know, upwards of 15 million people watching in season four. What, why, why has it caught on so much in America? What do, what do you think is the secret sauce? Um, I don't know. I wish I did because I'd be bottling it and selling it. Um, but, you know, it, it seems to have, of course, on all across the world, which is just incredible. And, you know, for, for a show that is so British, you know, um, you know, it's, it's incredible that it seems to have spoken to so many different cultures and audiences all over the world. I think ultimately it's it's just good storytelling, and Julian has created this um, you know, these amazing characters and this, this cross section of this community that live in this house. And so there's you know there's a there's a character for everyone to love or love to hate, or you know there's drama, there's romance, there's comedy, there's, you know, the, the more light-hearted stories, and, and then, you know, there's some traumatic stories in there as well, with the death of Matthew and, and Sybil, and obviously what's happened to Anna in series four. Um, so I think it's a mixture of all of those things, really, but I'm just, I mean, I'm just really pleased that, that, it, that it has become, you know, the success it has, and that, that people love to watch it so much. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just such a joy for us that, 
that people get so much joy out of, out of viewing it. So. And I, I'm going to ask, and I know you won't tell me, but aren't you're currently in production on season five? Yes. Anything? Is there any? I mean, even uh, the, the tiniest of hints. I mean, is there a moment of happiness for Hannah and Bates at least in season five? Is there some? Is, does she smile ever? <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, she, she smiles occasionally in season five. Um, we do. We start season five with Anna and Bates in in a slightly more positive place because if we, you know, we're, um, the season finale in America of, of season four was a year on from right. um, from you know the attack. So you know, time has moved forward, and they are Anna and Bates are certainly trying to move forward as well with their lives. But there is obviously still this shadow hanging over them. Um, so they still have, you know, a few, a few hurdles to cross, unfortunately. Yeah. And with all the attention, with the enormous success of it, your profile has been raised. I mean, you're doing your debut in the West End in a starring role, um, but it also has given you the chance to be patron of a couple of charities. Uh, just talk about what that means to be able to do something like that. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, you know, I'm patron of three charities. One, uh, two quite large charities. One, um, Combat Stress, who help veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. And obviously, um, the obvious connection was I I did a lot of work with them before when I was doing research for the film that I did, playing a, a soldier with traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress. And they were so incredible with me and helped me so much. And um, and it was a charity that I, I just really wanted to get involved in, so I'm, I'm patron to them, and also Plan International, who sponsor children in um, third world countries. I've sponsored a child with them for the last 10 years, privately, and I've now become a patron to them as well, so hopefully I'll do a, a trip with them uh, later in the year. And then a smaller charity that I work with called Rosie's Rainbow Fund, which is a charity close, quite close to where I live. Um, and that's connected with this, this day school I went to, um, at Carolyn Malin, who is one of the owners of the school. Her daughter sadly passed away of vasculitis um, when she was 11 years old, and that was 10 years ago. Um, and so what they set up, her name was Rosie, and they set up a fund in her name to help children that have long stays in hospital um, and to help their families, too, so to offer support for you know, children and their families when they're having long stays or, you know, and there's no um, um, kind of, you know, determination about what illness it is or anything else. They help disabled children, terminally ill children, children that are just in for short stays in hospital, whatever it is, and they do that by providing music workshops for the children and, um, you know, grievance counselling if needed for the parents as well as um, you know, massage therapies for parents and, and things like that. Because when Rosie was in hospital, she said, you know, she was quite bored. She spent a lot of time in there. It was her idea that she really wanted to make these this time easier for, for children in her position, which is an amazing thing for an 11-year-old to say. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a really wonderful thing to be able to, you know, use, if you like, the success of Downton to be able to raise awareness for for these charities, you know, especially the smaller ones that, that maybe need that extra push. So that's, you know, I, I really enjoy I really enjoy that that part of the whole success. It's it's a real you know, it's a real gift to be able to to do that and, you know, and you know, help in any way you can really, whether it be small or just giving up a little bit of time to, to visit people or, or whatever it be. Yeah, no, it's it's marvelous. And I know that uh... I guess you'll be in probably in rehearsals for Rabbit Hole in mid-August, won't you? When the <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, the uh, first week of rehearsals overlap the last week of filming of Downton, which I'm slightly nervous about. Um, <laughs> well, so, I'm going to add to that n nervousness because you know the Emmys are early this year; they're also in late August. So you're you might really be pulled in all different directions. So I hope that I hope that you are having to make a transatlantic flight uh, in late August. That oh, well, that would be lovely. We'll, we'll wait and see. But um, yes, no, it, you know, it's really exciting, you know, um, to have Rabbit Hole. And you know, I mean, I, I love, you know, I, I like to be under a little bit of pressure with work, and it makes it all the more exciting, like I say. So we, it's kind of what we all wish for, really. You know, it's great to be yeah. moving straight from Downs and straight on to, you know, a, another great job. So I'm excited. Well, congratulations. Thank you.